Welcome everybody to another weekly Village Torah Torah portion discussion. I'm your host, Rabbi Drew. This week is the, the Parsha of Bahalotcha or Bahaloscha. Lots of stuff going on. We can talk about lots of different things taking place within this week's Torah portion. I want to focus on something that's been curious to me. It's actually, to be honest, something I've never really explored. I've never explored before. I've just never explored it before. I've been very, my curiosity has been piqued by this. It sort of sticks out in this week's Torah portion, at least to me. So we have in the 11th chapter in the book of Numbers, we have this really interesting thing that uh, throughout the 11th chapter, but I really want to focus on uh, verses four through nine in my discussion here, which is the riffraff in there. So the context is that the B'nai Israel, the children of Israel, start complaining bitterly in front of God. They cry out to Moses. He prays to the Lord. The fire dies down. Um, okay. Then the riffraff, the riffraff, Baha Safsuf, the riffraff in their midst felt a gluttonous craving. And then the Israelites wept and said, if only we had meat to eat, if only. Now we remember the fish that we used to eat freely in Egypt, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, the garlic. We had it so good. We had it great in Egypt. Do you remember when we were in Egypt? Best of times. It was the best days ever. Now we're suffering. We're suffering in the desert. Why, why did we have to leave the great <laughs> provisions we were receiving in Egypt? Now our gullets are shriveled. There is nothing at all. Nothing but this man that we have to look to to eat. Now that's their complaint. And then the text goes on. Now the man or mana, in Hebrew it's man. So I'm just going to use that because mana or mana, mana, mana is just a translation of man. And it's not even really that descriptive. So I'm just going to call it man. Now this man was like coriander seed. And in color it was like bedellium. I don't know what bedellium is to be honest, but it was like that. The people would go about and gather it, grind it between millstones or pound it into a, in a mortar, boil it in a pot and make it into cakes. It tasted like rich cream. That sounds delicious. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm starting to get really hungry. That sounds deliciously tasty. When the dew fell on the camp at night, the man would fall upon it. Okay, so that's the context about what's going on here. Now, ultimately what ends up happening, I'm just gonna provide a further literary context in case you're curious of what happens afterwards. What's the aftermath? <clears throat> um, so I'm gonna read it just to provide a literary context of what the aftermath of this complaining is, but I wanna really focus and get back into this. Moses heard the people weeping, every clan apart, each person at the entrance of their tent. The Lord was very angry, angry and Moses was distressed. And Moses said to the Lord, why have you dealt ill with your servant? And why have I not enjoyed your favor that you have laid the burden of all this people upon me? Did I conceive this entire people? Did I bear them that you should say to me, carry them in your bosom as a nurse carries an infant to the land that you have promised on oath to their fathers? Where am I? to get meat, to give to all of those people. When they whine before me and say, give us meat to eat. I cannot carry all this people by myself because it is too much for me. If you would deal thus with me, kill me. Please just kill me, God, <laughs> and let me see no more of my wretchedness. <laughs> Moses says, the Jewish people are driving me crazy. Death would be better than <laughs> trying to lead them. Okay, then the Lord said to Moses, Gather 70 of Israel's elders from who, of whom you have experienced as elders and officers, officers of the people. They have leadership experience. And bring them to the tent of meeting and let them take their place there with you. I will come down and speak with you there. I will draw upon the spirit that is upon you and put it upon them. They shall share the burden of the people with you and you shall not bear it alone. And say to the people, purify yourselves for tomorrow and you shall eat meat. For you have kept whining before the Lord and saying, if only we had meat to eat. Indeed, we were better off in Egypt. Remember the good old days? <clears throat> the Lord will give you meat and you, you're going to eat. But guess what? Be careful what you ask. <laughs> Be careful what you wish, wish for. You just may get it. Uh, it continues. You shall not eat one day, not two days, not even five days or 10 or 20. No, 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 no. An entire month 
until it comes out of your nostrils and becomes loathsome to you. For you have rejected the Lord who is among you by whining before him and saying, oh, why did we ever leave Egypt? <laughs> God is literally saying, be careful what you wish for. I'm just going to give it to you and it'll come out of your nostrils. It'll come out of your ears, right? You'll have more meat than you'll know what to do with. And Moses says, Moses responded back to God, uh, the people who are with me number 600,000 men, yet you say I'm going to give them enough meat to eat for an entire month? Could enough flocks and herds be slaughtered to suffice for them? Or could all the fish of the sea be gathered for them to suffice for them? And the Lord answered Moses, is there a limit to the Lord's power? You shall soon see whether what I have said happens to you or not. Moses went out and reported the words of the Lord to the people. He gathered 70 of the people's elders and stationed them around the tent. Then the Lord came down in a cloud and spoke to him. <clears throat> he drew upon the spirit that was on him and put it upon the 70 elders. And when the spirit rested upon them, they spoke in ecstasy and did not continue. Now, there's a whole incident here with Eldad and Medad. I'm not going to go into it because that <laughs> sort of draws us away. <clears throat> but then... Moses then re-enters the camp together with these elders of Israel. A wind from the Lord started up, swept quail from the sea, and strewed them all over the camp. About a day's journey on this side, a day's journey on that side, all around the camp, and even two cubits deep on the ground. The people set to gathering quail all that day and night and all the next day. Even one who had gathered <clears throat> least had ten homers. The idea is they had a lot. And they spread them out all around the camp. The meat was still between their teeth, nor yet chewed when the anger of the Lord blazed forth against the people, and the Lord struck the people with a very severe plague. That place was known, named Kivrot Hatava, which literally translates to graves of the craving, or craving graves, maybe we could call it, craving grave, uh, because the people who had the craving were buried there. Uh, then the people set out from Kivrot Hatava for Hatsira. Okay, that is the broader that is the broader literary context. These people, they're wandering the desert, so it's totally forgivable. I, I would imagine it's totally forgivable. It's probably not the most hospitable of conditions. Uh, <clears throat> in addition to actually having to, um, in addition to not being able to eat what you want exactly. Now, I mean, it's interesting because the way that the text presents the complaint of this this asafsuf, uh, this sort of mixture, which we're going to get into, this uh, riffraff, as it were, is the English translation we have in front of us, this riffraff. So what does this riffraff want? They want delicious stuff. We're like, we used to have it so good back in Egypt. We had all this delicious fresh food, and now all we have is this mod. Now, right after their complaint, the text tells us, the reader, by the way, this mod was delicious. So it's not like they're getting terrible food they're not getting <clears throat> they're not getting bottom of the barrel provisions they're not getting stale who knows what they're getting mon they can do stuff with mon and they can and it's delicious it looks good um and yet they were complaining they were complaining against god and then it's interesting because moses really doubted that anything can be sufficiently done any meat being provided for this entire people, entire people in the desert, Moses doubted, and God said, I've got a lot of power here. <laughs> if <clears throat> You may be doubting me, Moses. I have a lot of power. But I'm, I'm going to show you. Like God is even telling Moses, I'm going to show you. In addition to, <clears throat> then God also says, basically telling the all these people saying, we want meat, we want meat. Oh, you want meat. One day, two days, five days. I'm going to give you more than 10, 20 days worth of a whole month. You know what? It's going to be coming out of your nostrils. In our days, we would say out of your ears. You're going to be just so disgusted. Just so much meat. Meat, 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 meat. So God ultimately gets back at them. And at some point, a bunch of people die. It's unclear what, how or what or why. I mean, I could suspect why, that God really meant to discourage this, this outbreak of uh, dissatisfaction. And also, it's almost as if God is saying, look, did you forget 
your existence in Egypt? Did you forget your experience there? It wasn't Disney World. <laughs> Egypt was not Disney World. Yeah, you may have had these fresh foods in Egypt, even if that were the case. And yet, it was a miserable existence. The work that was placed upon you by the Egyptians was terrible. And now at least you have your freedom. And oh, by the way, you have the man, which tastes delicious. Who are these people? Who is this Asafsuf? Who is this rabble of people? And what are they arguing? Okay, so for some insight, we have here Rashi. I've, I've mentioned him before, early medieval Franco-German commentator. He is sort of the prince amongst uh, the, the medieval commentators. Uh, his name stands for Rabbi Shlomo Yitzchaki, and he said, this is the heir of Rav that had gathered themselves uh, when they left Egypt. And so, okay, so that's the literal translation. And then we, of course, we have this description here. So it comes from the root asaf to gather. So they were sort of a, a gathering, a gathered, gathered. So Rashi says this is Saf Suf, which we don't really see. I don't know if we see elsewhere, but he says this is the heir of Rav. Now, who is this heir of Rav? <laughs> okay. So this Erev Rav we've encountered before. In Exodus 12, 38, a mixed multitude in Erev Rav, a mixed multitude went up with the Bnei Israel that went up with the Jewish people and a lot of livestock, flocks, and herds. So a lot of people, uh, um, I guess this mixed multitude. What is this mixed multitude? Rashi there in Exodus says, it's a mingling of various nations who had become proselyte, proselytes. So they were a bunch of, uh, of converts. Basically, a lot of converts who left Egypt with the Jewish people, and they were sort of mixed. That's why it's called a, an Arab Rav. So Arab is mixed, and Rav, multitude, a lot, sort of many, plenty. And that's the idea that Rashi is pointing to, at least in, in Rashi's conception here. So in Rashi's conception of what's going on here in Exodus, who else were left with the Jewish people? A bunch of other people that were mixed in. And then he then says, oh, what is this? It's also... Um, they also, or this Asaf Suf, that they're, the rabble got mixed in, as it were. Okay, so we have, ooh, this is an interesting one. Okay, I'm going to mention it, Sforno. So it's a uh, Rabbi Avadia Ben Yaakov Sforno, who uh, passed away in 1150, so an early 12th century commentator. He said, what is, this, what is this complaint about? Who will feed, who will feed us meat? We want meat. <clears throat> he says, um, to test, they said this in order to test if he would permit perm incestuous relations to the people. Continuing on with Rashi and, and sort of Rashi's take on this incident. Then we see uh, what he says on the fifth verse here. So, if you say that they meant that the Egyptians gave them fish for nothing, because they, they did say, we, we just got it freely. Um, then I ask, also in, going back to Exodus, but does it not state, go therefore now and work for there shall no straw be, shall be given to you. Now, if they did not give them straw for nothing, would they have given them fish for nothing? Likely the answer is obviously not, right? If they won't even give them straw to build with, why would they give them fish? So what then does this word chinam mean? It means free, free from, without us having been burdened with heavenly commands. Okay. I think what, first of all, that's an interesting, definitely a more religious spin on things of, of, for Rashi to say, and he's getting this from Amidrash. The idea is we got, whenever, I guess whenever we got the fish in Egypt, we didn't have commands. Uh, it's unclear because Rashi seems to, not be wanting to consider that the Egyptians even gave them fish in the first place. I guess the idea is now that fish are being given to that. Um, no, they, they definitely aren't getting fish in the desert. Okay. I'm not really sure what that means. So what seems to be coming out of this, at least in Rashi's read, because this is such a, a bizarre sort of thing is the, actually what seems to be coming out of this uh, for Rashi here is that they are, they're frustrated, they're complaining, but do they really belong? This, this heir of Rav, this is Safsuf. But what's, I, I never thought about this until I, I checked this out, which is, so we go back to this fourth verse, that the rabble in their midst, this is Safsuf, 
felt a gluttonous craving, and they, but then the Israelites wept as if, it's interesting, because once we see it this way, then it's, okay, the Asafsuf were, 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 felt this gluttonous craving, hitavu tava. They were very much having this craving, and they were Asher Bikibro, so they were in their midst. And then in the second half of the, the verse, then we see that the children of Israel then wept. Also, they responded and they said, oh, who will feed us meat? Right? As if that the, this rabble, the Sasaf Suf, are the ones that initiated this, this complaining. They initiated these desires. And they, they were the ones who <laughs> really, that were not for them, the children of Israel may not have uh, also have complained about this. Okay, so what is kind of interesting that we see that this, that this desire for food is generated initially from this Asaf Suf, from this, this rabble, and then the children of Israel pick up on it and say, we want meat, right? What for me is fascinating, and I, I think it sort of pops out and it's sort of uh, glaring, which is the notion of desiring, of having such cravings. Now, we actually have an articulation of this by Rabbi Vadia Sforno, an Italian commentator who, who died in 1150. And he said, they said this in order to test if God would permit, or maybe even Moses, would permit incestuous relations to God's people. Meaning there they op- ask openly for me and in their hearts for sexual gratification other than their wives. So that this was a testing of not just simply of of the physical desire for food consumption, but also physical desire for uh, inappropriate sexual uh, consumption or desire. So what this commentator, Sforno, is really pointing out is that this was, there was something more going on. Meaning, and, and even what the complaining of the Safsuf, this rabble was doing was problematic, was deeply problematic. There was something wrong with it on the face of it. And, that the inspiration to the Jewish, to the Bnei Israel, to the Israelites was not healthy, right? And then ultimately we get this sort of a snowball effect that the children of Israel are complaining, oh, we don't have the leeks, the cork, cucumbers, the gourds, the fish, all the good stuff we used to have in the land of Egypt. But we have, um, yeah, we're really frustrated. Can we please have meat? And Moses is just says, the children of Israel, the Jews are driving me crazy, kill me, God. Right. That's, uh, but ultimately, God comes to save Moses' day. He says, "I'll provide, but I'm going to show it to them. I'm going to give it to. Them. I'm really going to give it to them. Be careful what you ask, wish for. They're going to get it. And really, also not just getting it, um, but doing also two things. God gets to do two other things. One is show His power, show His might, show His ability, even to Moses. I mean, to the children of Israel, to the Israelites. Yeah, that's big. That's powerful. That's important." But even to Moses, Moses who doubts God, where am I going to get all this meat to feed everybody? All the fish in the sea, is that even going to be enough? I'm, that is a really interesting point that happens that, Mo, that Moses even is shown by God. But the other is that, that God is not just showing the power and might of his abilities in providing meats, but also in showing that this is ridiculous. All these complaints are ridiculous. This man is good right? It's sure you can have these supernatural wonders of having this, this quail being delivered in vast quantities, right? In beyond the circumference of the camp and even piling up. And so everybody had plenty of quail and coming out of their nostrils, so much quail. At the same time, was that good? I don't know. And what happens afterwards? What happened after that month? <laughs> Who knows? Maybe they were just sick of quail. But ultimately, uh, Moses gets shown that he can bear this. He's got God's backing. And on top of that, God gets to show that not only can he do it, but also ultimately some of them end up uh, experiencing a plague. But ultimately, in the end, what I find fascinating was looking at this Asaf Suf, who is this rabble? And this text even seems to make it seem as if they're not really part of the Jewish people, that they're sort of a, uh, just a, uh, I don't know, another group of people that have some sort of gotten mixed in um, and have uh, become part of the, the children of Israel to some degree or another. So 
interesting things to consider in this week's tour portion uh, when it comes to the desires of what people got to eat in the desert with meat and really the sufficiency of man, but even also the power of God to provide. All right. Well, thank you so much and Shabbat Shalom.